Welcome everybody to my podcast, Big Little Small Talk. I'm Megan O'Hara Sullivan and I love to talk, but I also love to listen. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoy the episode. Good afternoon, listeners, and thanks for tuning in. You're on Big Little Small Talk with me, Megan O'Hara Sullivan. Today, my guest is Kylie Sprott. She's a director, an advisor, and a speaker, and so much more too. Welcome to Big Little Small Talk, Kylie. Thank you for having me. Now, Sprott, I've met some Sprats in my life, but not some Sprots. Where do Sprots come from? It's actually a a Scottish. Yeah, so the Sprots actually come from Stranra and uh, a place called Les Walt in in the the lower part of Scotland. Uh How far back in the generations are those Scottish folk? Uh, Yes, that's an interesting question because only 600 years and a genealogist at Edinburgh Castle actually told me that uh, they wouldn't officially be really Scottish because they'd only been there for 600 years, (laughs) which I found quite entertaining. But uh, yeah, so about 600 years. I think before that they might have come potentially from maybe Germany, but I'm not really sure. We couldn't go much further back than that. Do you meet many Sprots in your travels? Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but Sprot is actually quite a well-known name in Canada. And I think a lot of the Sprots went to Nova Scotia and they really flourished there. So there's actually a Sprot Business School and a Sprot Academy and a university and a stockbroking firm. So, yeah, they did exceptionally well over there. You need to get to Canada, girl, because you can ride on that wave of (laughs) uh, success over there. I have actually been there. And um, I remember we did some due diligence in a very small firm and they had a sprot working for them. So there you go. It's actually quite a common name there. Not that you need to ride on anyone's fame or anyone's hard work because you are such a hardworking and an incredible person yourself. So Kylie, you are, we can give you a little bit of Toowoomba status because I see that you are in Toowoomba four months ago doing an AICD, which is an Australian Institute of Company Directors briefing. And it was entitled Igniting Innovation for Success in the Boardroom. Do you have a big Toowoomba connection? And yeah, I'll, I'll ask you that first. Yes, I do. In fact, I, I love going to Toowoomba, mainly because I spent quite a bit of my childhood there. My two grandmothers lived there. They both had lived in the Darling Downs with their husbands and raised their children there. They retired to Toowoomba. So when I was little, I used to spend a lot of time going backwards and forwards between their two houses. And they were best friends, which was a wonderful, wonderful thing. But one of my grandmothers, my gran, lived on Getty Street. And my grandma lived on Flinders Street. And so um, when we were quite small, we'd spend time walking backwards and forwards. There were two sweet shops along the way. So if we were lucky, our grandmothers would give us 20 cents or 50 cents. And we would spend that very carefully on the little journey between the two houses. But yeah, lots of wonderful memories. And um, both sides of my family, my two parents and their parents came from the Darling Down. So connection to Allera on the Sprott side and also McMillan's and the Shannon's on that side. And then also a connection to uh, John Derry and Bowen Bill on the Clarkson side. Right. So you are rural people. We'll we'll, we'll say that you're a rural person. Yeah. Well, I'd love to say that I am, (laughs) but because I grew up in Brisbane, I I don't know how well I would go living in a rural environment, but um, I love having that connection through my family. Well, what you do when you come up to Toowoomba is you get your R.M. Williams boots, even though you mightn't wear them very often. You put them on so that that sort of, you know, shows your authenticity. That's yeah, a good idea, yeah. yes. Now tell me, what was the briefing that you did in Toowoomba, the, the um, authentic leadership? What, what does that mean? So I think we were talking about leadership with artificial intelligence and also efficiency, I believe, was what we were talking about at that particular one. There was another speaker after me who talked really around artificial intelligence and technology. I was really focused on innovation and very much efficiency. And so for me, I believe efficiency does come with innovation. I think they're like two sides of the one coin. So I think if you're really searching for efficiency, you tend to do that through innovation. And if you are very innovative, you can often find more efficient ways of doing things. So I was sort of talking about how when you're running a business or if you're a company director in particular, it's very important to have a whole range of different little ways of monitoring whether or not the business is encouraging a culture of innovation and also encouraging people to always be looking for ways to be more efficient. Mm, certainly innovation is the buzzword in the corporate world, corporate um, circles at the moment, isn't it? So a lot of people sort of don't really know how AI, they're, they're more probably afraid of it um, than anything else and they think that it's going to take over and we're all going to lose our jobs. H- how do you envisage that AI, how, how would you use AI to improve efficiencies? Well, I think that it is still a bit of a journey, but having said that, it has been around for a very long time and we all use AI most days, we just don't realise we are. Like with our phones, for instance, there's a lot of AI already built into our phones. 
So I think it's really about um, enhancing and making your work life easier. So finding better ways of doing things. The only thing I think is there's a couple of things that, you know, potentially um, aren't necessarily always accurate with AI. So you have to be kind of conscious that it's not necessarily the gospel, what you get out of AI, but it can help you work faster, more Mm. efficiently. I did uh, hear an interesting story on the radio the other day about comparing people who went to the GP and they had the AI as one GP, just all over the audio, and then a real doctor as the other. And they were able to um, be more empathetic and, really? <laughs> and because they didn't get ground down by the work. But, mm. uh, you know, I guess as long as there's a human overseeing it. But you have had a big time of it lately, haven't it? haven't you? And you again this year, have been nominated in the Governance Top 100 finalists for the fifth consecutive year. Oh, yes. Yes, that's correct. So how do you get nominated for that? I think it's one of those things where you have to be in it to win it. I was originally on a podcast, actually, I was interviewed by the founders of that a particular program and they encouraged me to apply. So I always apply every year. I think I'm always a bridesmaid, never the bride. Oh, you well, that's was my next question was how do you feel? How many times are you uh, going to keep entering? I know, that's the thing. I think that for me it's actually just a good reminder about, you know, for me good governance is about just running a business really well. And I think so I, I kind of enjoy having that opportunity to talk about the sort of things I've been doing in the past 12 months. At some point maybe it might be too many times, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can find something else yes, to apply for. That's right. Um, so, I mean, it's a, that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful accolade. Um, now, you have had a really big year. We want to go through some of the things that have happened this year. Five months ago, you went onto the advisory board for the Queensland Futures Institute. Now, tell people who are listening what what that is. It's a think tank. Mm. What's a think tank mean? Yeah, so I was just thinking, gosh, you've done your research, haven't you? I was well, thinking, what I, has happened this year? Can I admit something to you, Kylie? I just go onto the internet and search people. And oh, okay. most of the time, it's very, very difficult to stalk people. You were too easy to stalk. And there was too much information for me to read. I, you know, I think I only read the first year of the things that you'd posted oh, on right. LinkedIn. Oh, there we go. Yes, well, there you go. Um, I, yes, it was an early adopter of LinkedIn. I was one of the, I think I was the first 200 in Australia. I had my 20-year anniversary of being on LinkedIn the other day. So I thought that was very funny. Um, but, yes, yeah, so the Queensland Futures Institute, I've actually been associated with them for, I think it's about five years actually as well. And I was an ambassador previously, and so now I'm I'm on the advisory board. And what I really love about the Queensland Futures Institute is that they bring together, as you say, it's a bit of a think tank, but they bring together, you know, really key decision makers from an academic perspective. So the the Queensland universities participate in that, but also they bring together large corporates. And so a lot of the decision makers from there, but also from government and um, from a policy perspective. So you bring together these three sort of, you know, um, different perspectives. And it's really interesting just learning how Queensland is being shaped for the future. And they, they're actually very active. Like some of their events are excellent, I have to say. So they had one this week where they had the CEO of Bright Super talking about, which is again another amazing Queensland business, talking about what they're doing in terms of Queensland. So as a proud Queenslander, I really enjoy seeing the progress that's being made in this state. Um, and so it's just, for me, it's really enjoyable. I, I learn a lot going to those events. Mm. Because you'll often hear political reporting talking about referencing think tanks and, you know, they'll, they'll reference one as a right-leaning think tank or a left-leaning think tank. So just explain to the listeners what would happen at these think tanks, who funds it, who... Yeah, so they have memberships, right? You can actually attend events by buying a ticket, but there's also memberships that are there. So a lot of the universities and, uh, you know, a lot of large corporates, for instance, have got these memberships where they actually get to go to the events and have a voice. But they also have a lot of panels, et cetera, where people get to have a, you know, they bring these experts in to talk about things like economics, for instance, what the economic outlook would be. They have particular councils as well. So lots of opportunities for people to contribute. But in terms of how it's funded, yeah, it's funded generally through memberships. It's From a membership based. And so the, the things that are discussed, are those ideas then taken somewhere? Are they sort of, mm. you know, then fed into form policy or? Yeah, I think they often are. You know, a lot of the, so for instance, there's, you know, there's an event coming up, which will be at Parliament House. They have all sorts of different events, which I think certainly drive policy and certainly drive the dialogue around different policy decisions. I think what's really interesting to me is the people 
they're very well attended those events but when people go you see that people are really engaged in the conversation and I think it's quite progressive because it's talking about how do we you know make Queensland a better place where you can live and do business so it's good. Mm -hmm. Sounds very exciting. Okay so that was in the come to an event. I will do definitely. So now that was the last five months. Eight months ago you became a non-executive director of RSPCA. Yes yes I did yes it was a big January wasn't it? I think it will happen in January, February this year. So yes, I love the RSPCA. So I'm very passionate about that business. And so what I have found over time that definitely if I am working in an organisation or with an organisation that I am very um, aligned to in terms of its purpose, and particularly when I really like the people who work there as well, it's just bliss. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the RSPCA is an organisation that I have always loved and always been very impressed with. I've been, I think, a donor a monthly donor for RSPCA for maybe 20 years and both of our rescue dogs come from the RSPCA and uh, so when the opportunity came along to to go through the process of being considered for a non-executive director role I was very excited to do that mm. and I'm very happy to volunteer my time for them we actually have the board meeting tomorrow morning on a Saturday but I don't mind I, I would be very happy to go mm. out there and spend time there because I'm very connected to their purpose mm. and uh, it's a great organization mm. so that's a volunteer position mm -hmm. and of course some boards are paid positions as well for people who don't know about sort of the the corporate world and how you've become a, a director can you talk a little bit about that yeah sure I get asked that question a lot actually because you know it's funny I think as your career goes on you know early days I'd never would have really thought about that as being something that I would be interested in but I've been working in corporates for gosh over 30 years now so it's been a long time and obviously during that time you get more and more appreciation for good governance and you get more and more appreciation of how a board works and it was about 10 years ago maybe actually maybe 13 years ago, um, I was working um, at Cardinal at the time in a, in a big global role and uh, the CEO there was excellent and encouraged me to do the AICD course and uh, at that point it was really more to help me in terms of how I engaged with the board as an executive and to give me a really good understanding about um, how it worked to have those meaningful conversations. I lapped up that opportunity, I thought it was fantastic and then what happened was in parallel to the executive work I was doing, a period of that, it was probably about eight or nine years, I was doing board work on the side as well as my executive work. And the opportunities started out where it would be people who knew me and knew my skill set and wanted me to contribute to a board in a particular way. Then all sorts of different opportunities tend to come to you. If you do reasonably good work and you're a good person, people know that you work hard for them. And so more opportunities come along, advisory board roles, free work. I've done quite a bit of voluntary work sometimes in a board capacity, sometimes in an advisory board capacity. And so, again, with organisations that I felt aligned to their purpose. And so over time, eventually, that just became something that I was more and more interested in. And I do really like contributing at that level because you get to talk about strategy and a purpose and you talk about the organisation and what you're trying to achieve. And it's a different kind of engagement than being an executive and I really enjoy it. So it's worked out really well. If you've just tuned in, you're on Big Little Small Talk and we're talking to Kylie Sprott, who is an executive woman. Can we say that? Sure, yes. <laughs> you can call me whatever you like. I don't mind. Kylie, before you were talking about being on an advisory board, what's the difference between being on a board position and an advisory board? Yeah, so I'm on a few of those at the moment. I think I'm on two or three advisory boards at the moment. And I like the advisory boards because I often say to people who want to have a board career, it's really good to cut your teeth on advisory boards because it's not the same time commitment and you don't have, you have a lot of responsibility, but you don't have the same kind of responsibilities as a non-executive director. So if you take on a non-executive director type role, there are a lot of responsibilities there so you need to be really careful about you know what you're engaging in you need to do a lot of due diligence before you accept that kind of role whereas an advisory board role you get to have a governance type um, contribution but it's a different kind of engagement so you're effectively giving advice to the executive team and um, the ones I've enjoyed the most um, have been where they actually take the advice and take it on board and uh, the ones I've enjoyed least have been where you feel like your voice isn't really being heard or listen to or the advice isn't really being engaged with. So, but the, there's one I'm on at the moment, which I really enjoy, which is with Intellect Labs. And they do R&D tax and grants, and they're just such a fantastic organization. And I've been on their advisory board since they first started. And it just always amazes me, everything we talk about in the advisory board meetings, 
come back the next quarter and it's actually implemented. They're That's amazing. Good. And so it, unsurprisingly, very successful. But also there's a, t- a much less time commitment, I find, with the advisory boards. Like most of them are generally quarterly and it's a few hours and you might attend the strategy day, mm. but it's not the same level of commitment. Yeah. But of course, it's not the meeting time, it's the reading time before, yes. isn't it? That yes. takes all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes, that's correct. Now, before you said R&D, so the listeners, that is? Oh, research and development. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. And what, what the, the, the name of that? firm that you're working for what what intellect lab yeah what yeah. sort of things are they doing well it's such an interesting company because they work with innovators so they work with companies that are really entrepreneurial and doing really interesting innovations in all sorts of different industries and what they do is they help them navigate the landscape around different grants there's so many grants and it's different at state and national level and obviously every time there's a change of government that impacts the grants but so all these different grants are available and sometimes they're available all the time sometimes just for short little and so they help their clients navigate those to help them get grants to help them with their business and to grow their business but then they also help them with their research and development tax application as well so they get get that extra piece so they work primarily with businesses that are very much about innovation so even though it doesn't sound as exciting as you might think it actually is really interesting because they're doing such interesting work with all these very creative innovative organizations Mm. And what sort of, let's go back to the RSPCA at the moment, what sort of challenges are they facing at the moment? Is it the usual, you know, workforce and those sorts of things? Well, it's actually a much more complex business than I initially understood when I went on to the board. And like probably like most people, I assumed it would be primarily about, you know, animals that need to be rehomed. It's, oh, it's so much more than that. Like they do a huge amount of work in the wildlife space uh, they're actually creating a new wildlife hospital on the south side of Brisbane, so which is a big undertaking. They do a lot of fundraising, but they also have a, a number of businesses that actually create, I think they're, they're really good businesses because they create a profit for um, RSPCA to use to fund the business. So things such as, for instance, they have an op shop strategy, so people actually donate things and they sell those and the funds help fund care for the animals. Um, and uh, so they have all those different elements and they have like a, I think it's called World for, World for Pets where they sell all sorts of pet supplies. But as per every other organisation, they have to um, deal with all the other usual challenges such as staffing and transformation and technology and having cyber strategies and all those other bits and pieces, but also dealing with, for instance, if there's a change of government that you know could potentially impact some of the funding that comes through so making sure that stakeholder engagement is really strong. They've also got the beautiful brand of the RSPCA mm. and, you know, the expectation of the public. Yeah. Do you ever, have you ever gone onto a board that you haven't, it hasn't aligned with you something, or someone has said this is probably going to be something that you'll learn and it surprised you in a good way? I've actually been really fortunate. I think all the boards that I've been on, I've really enjoyed. And I know some people who've gone onto boards who've really not enjoyed the experience but so far I've really enjoyed them all probably the one that was a bit of a surprise was I had the great opportunity to be on this manufacturing business board the Winston group I really enjoyed that board it was fantastic I just loved the family who were the founders of that business they were the things that they do they manufactured all sorts of packaging materials and I really connected to the values of that business and I really liked the executive team and I liked the other board members. It was a very enjoyable experience working there and I got to learn a lot. Like they would take us on tours around the factory and it was great. I really enjoyed it. And it wouldn't be something that I necessarily thought was going to be completely in my sweet spot, but I absolutely loved it. Eventually I decided the family made a decision to sell the business. I have to say I was really sad when that came to a conclusion. But I think if you're working with really interesting, good people who have good intentions and good values, then it's it's a good experience. And so I was very fortunate there. Mm. I liked it. How long would you say that you would stay on a board for? Or is there no normal for you? I was on the board for Position Partners, which, again, I loved that one very much. That was actually my first one. Um, and that was, I think, gosh, I think that was eight years. It was a long time and I loved it. Yeah, it was mm. great. Mm. And I would have stayed on there as well forever, actually, if I had the option. But that business was also eventually sold off to Mitsui. So, um, so that's the thing. Sometimes, you know, you might want to stay forever. And that's the other thing with, with I guess, with non-executive director roles. You know, they do have rotation and 
it's not always going to be forever. It's a different kind of engagement. That's why it's really, really important to make sure you enjoy it, make the most of it while it's there. Yeah, I grab up every opportunity. Mm. Uh, look, I, I know you've written an article called A Big F or a Little F, <laughs> and I did a whole series of podcasts called Give an F Over 50, and it was all about um, mm. people, particularly women over 50, you know, their relationship to family, food, fun, you know, that sort of thing. But I didn't think at the time to ask them about their views on feminism. And that's mm. what your article was about. Yes. So long way of asking you the question about being a female in a fairly traditionally, getting much, much, much better, traditionally male-dominated field. Yes. It's a really interesting story about that article because I actually managed to stay in Jermaine Greer's old residence in London, which was unbelievable, mind-blowing. And How I did was... you manage that? Well, I, it's a funny thing. I found her on Airbnb and the person who owns it had advertised it was Jermaine Greer's former residence. And so I was thrilled to bits to stay there and I've become really good friends with the woman who owns it. And so when I go to London now, I spend time with her. We hang out together and I get to, so I've been to that apartment now many times. It was really quite inspirational, like sort of she, at that point, I think she's just going through renovation now, but at that point she kept it pretty much very consistent with how it was when Jermaine had lived there. And so it just made me really reflect on her and her bravery as a woman in terms of really putting some, at the time, quite controversial views out into the world. And she was really brave in terms of really sort of attacking some of those quite conservative views of, of the time. So in terms of how I was brought up, I was brought up in quite a traditional kind of environment. When I went to university, I studied politics and film and media studies as my undergraduate degree. And so we got exposed to things I had never thought about before. And um, But having said that, I was, I was the middle child between two boys. And so I kind of had grown up kind of, I suppose, between two boys made me not realise that I didn't feel, what's the word, I, I felt like I was used to being in a male-dominated way, a male-dominated industry in a way because I'd had these two brothers. And so I didn't feel uncomfortable when I was working in male-dominated industries. And to be honest with you, I'm still very comfortable working with lots of men, but I realised it took me a while to realise that not every woman has that kind of level of comfort and not every woman's had the kind of experiences I've had where I've been well-respected in those environments. So again, everyone has different circumstances. And so I would say I'm definitely a feminist, and, but it took me a while to understand that, you know, being a, a feminist is also helping other women and especially those who don't have the same starting point. As I mean, we talk about sort of first wave, second wave, third wave feminists. And I think as a very strong feminist myself, I think the thing that hurts the most is hearing young people, young girls saying, I'm not a feminist. No, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> I know, I know. And I, I have to explain to them, but I think maybe the term doesn't, fully because at the time that was the perfect term feminine and fem the word feminist was appropriate but now it's it's kind of almost evolved beyond that because it's got this kind of backlash thing but when you talk about the concepts around you know equality for all people go oh, of course I'd be you know, totally engaged with that but yeah you know, I'm like you I don't like it when young women don't associate with that term luckily my daughter does yeah she's <laughs> definitely a feminist and we have great conversations yeah. about that I think for you, working in the corporate world, you will have noticed so many companies now have targets for having not only women on the board, but women executives. And it's meaningful too. And that's, you know, as much as people don't want to talk about having targets, sometimes you just have to force people into it. Mm. And then they realise there's a different, women look at things in a different way. They express themselves differently. They just have a different way of looking at things. Definitely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Did at Jermaine Greer's apartment, was there... 20 copies of the female eunuch or anything like that. <laughs> Actually, it was interesting because that was the one that I read when I was at university that blew my mind. And that was the one that Weiwei hasn't got in the apartment. She had a few other ones there, but she had these beautiful framed uh, photos of her when she lived in the apartment on the wall. So I was really enraptured with those. And there were all these bookcases everywhere. And um, so... Um, her books, do you think? Um, well, that bookcase, well, see, I'm sure when Jermaine lived there, those bookcases would have been full to the brim of books, but uh, the, the original bookcases are still there, but not with the, all the books that Jermaine yeah. would have had. Yeah. She's interesting. She lost me a little bit um, with her criticism of Julia Gillard. I, it yes. really um, yes, it I went against, um, against everything that she had sort of fought for. And, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now tell me about your philanthropic ways. Oh, so many things there. I guess, do you know what? It's a funny thing that 
as time has gone by, I've always had this really um, big drive to help other people less fortunate. And so I've really, for me particularly, anything to do with women, children, animals, you know, really keen to always be in that space. But also have done quite a bit of stuff with the Smith family because I really believe in education. And why this is all very interesting to me is that as time has gone by, I've done a lot of research into our family history and discovered, to my surprise, that my great great grandmother couldn't read and that when she got married there was like a little cross on her uh, marriage certificate which was really shocking to me because I get so much joy out of writing and reading and so the idea that one of my ancestors didn't have that privilege so that really made me feel even stronger about the importance of education and particularly for women and children and but also love anything to do with that animal. So, so yeah, I tend to be very happy to get engaged in causes that really connect with me as a person. So, so as a result, the Smith family, but also there's an orphanage in the Philippines that I'm also an ambassador for called Rainbow Illigan House, which is again, helping young children and particularly around their education. So yeah, so for me, it's, I feel like it's good to have an education. I feel incredibly privileged. I have an education and I'm always on my children about the importance of our education and that it's um, such a privilege and an honour to have that. And again, my grandmother, the one who, um, was li- who lived in Alara, she got a fully fledged uh, scholarship to PGC. She came from a, a family that didn't have a lot of money. They were quite poor, actually. And so um, for a woman of her age to get a full scholarship to PGC is very impressive, I think. And so for me, the education thing, and particularly anything to do with women, I'm, I'm always there. Yeah. Just going back to the conversation about your grandmother, you said that your, your two grandmothers were best friends. Were they best friends before they had the children all hooked up or were they best friends after? No, after. So, And what's so remarkable about that is that my parents got divorced and they remained best friends. And, and I just go, it, you know, it was interesting to me because they met each other through my parents when they got married and, and then they were both widows. And, and they just formed this amazing friendship. Like some of my happiest memories, I was thinking about that, is, was with my two grandmothers together and spending time with them in Toowoomba. And mm-hmm. like they had such different personalities. Like my grandma was very, very funny and very engaging and very optimistic. And is this your mother's father? My, my father's oh, mother. Oh. And I'd say that I feel that there's, I'm like her in many ways. And my mother's mother, my gran, she was Scottish and very stoic and, you know, didn't smile as much and was probably, didn't laugh as anywhere near as much as my grandma, but they were really good friends. And I didn't realise that that was unusual <laughs> until I got much older. I thought everyone's grandmas were mm. best friends. So I, was, I think it was just a wonderful thing to have this opportunity to spend time with both of them together. Thanks for tuning in, listeners. I'll just remind you that you're on 102.7 FM and we're on Big Little Small Talk and we're talking to Kylie Sprott, who is an amazing woman, an executive woman who's done lots and lots and lots of things and I am only a little bit partway through them. Um, how did you mention that your grandmother, Kylie, the, your grandmothers were best friends and that, that your parents got divorced? How did they navigate that? Did there was, a, was there a strain on? I think that was hard for them um, because, well, they, remembering that I was in Brisbane with you know, my, my mum and my dad eventually moved to the Gold Coast, but they were in Toowoomba. So in some ways they were kind of, they could still see each other without having to worry about it. I think they were terribly sad. I think it was really sad for them. I think it was sad for all of us really in lots of ways, but I think that they still managed to have that friendship. And it was interesting, my mum and I were talking just recently And at one point, my gran had a fall, and so she couldn't really stay in her own house. And so my mum brought her to Brisbane, and she felt she feels enormous remorse about that decision because I think she feels that was kind of absolutely heartbreaking for my grandma because she lost her best friend. And um, and so, and I think them being split up and not getting to see each other all the time was actually really hard for them. And um, it's one of those terrible things, isn't it? You know, you think you're making the right choice at the time. But it would have been better, I think, if they had both been in. It's an interesting conversation because I was just handing out at pre-poll this morning and having exactly the same conversation with the opposition, as you do, because it get, becomes um, <laughs> quite handing out. They were talking about a lot of their friends are moving to the Sunshine Coast. And I said, why would you do it? Why would you move away from your friendship group? And that connectivity and with your friends is the thing, I think, the, the sort of the source of life, you know, the 
the good, good things that yeah. keep you connected and ward off dementia, which I'm always <laughs> always worried about. And you say that you two are quite interested in politics and you studied politics when you yes. were younger. Yeah, yes, I did, yeah, yes. Yeah. Like, and for me, I, I do find, I find politics really interesting. And I think, again, as I've got older, actually, I think I've become more interested in that. So I actually do feel like I'm turning into my grandmother because I remember I had these very strong memories of both of them, but particularly Grandma Sprott. She would be like, I remember waking up in her house in Toowoomba and she would be pottering around and she would be making porridge, listening to the ABC News her slippers on and her pyjamas. And that's me to a T, always pottering around, listening to the news and very interested in listening to ABC News because I get a really good fix of what's going on from a political perspective. Um, and so I feel like that's something that has probably been there for a long time, but it's probably just got more and more interesting for me as I've got older. Yeah. Do you, I say to the young ones who are handing out, if you're conservative now, what's going to happen to you when you get older? Because we all, all get more conservative. And this young guy said to me the other day, well, if you're left now, what happens if you get conservative? <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, I hope that doesn't ever happen. <laughs> but, um, so, and you also said that you're a, you're a big traveller. You've talked a little bit about travelling to Scotland and, and you're a mother and you like the occasional glass of wine. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. And I, look, I, I could talk to you about Scotland for like hours and hours because I'll just, I'll, and, and I hope you're not going to think I'm a complete lunatic after I tell you this, but my gran, the one I was telling you about who was, was Scottish, she left Scotland when she was 15 with my great-grandmother and they left her father behind and they came out to Australia. And I think my great-grandfather was supposed to join them but never did. So two years ago in maybe a moment of madness, but I think it's a moment of brilliance, I went round Scotland to see where all my ancestors came from. And so I was where my, in the same street where my gran lived I saw her house and and she never got to go back so it was very sad for her never got to see her father again and never got to go back to this place that she loved and it was like uh it's on the Isle of Butte it's like a it's uh Rothsay is like in its day it was like the Ibiza of Scotland it was like yeah, this amazing Victorian seaside place it's still really beautiful anyway so in a moment of madness I actually bought a place it's <laughs> in the same street like 50 metres from where my gran lived in an old tenement building. She would have walked past that building. So I bought it. I knew the outside but had not seen inside. And uh, then I spent 18 months renovating it from afar. And what's so amazing about this story is what I love about this story is that I engaged the local genealogist because I wanted to find out more about my great-grandfather and a little bit because there was all this mystery surrounding my gran and her mother and so then I found out all this stuff about the family, but there were four generations of my family lived in that village and I can see them from my kitchen window. So if I look down, I can see that's where my great-great-grandmother died and that's where my grand grandfather lived. And yeah. so it's like this amazing kind of connection. And so for me, I love, I love going there mm. and I'm always dragging someone I know there, <laughs> friends and family, but it's just this beautiful connection. And one of the best things of all is, I remember going to the museum there to meet up with the genealogist and there were all these lovely old women there waiting for me and it was in winter so the museum was closed and they opened up for me. I was saying, look, I've gone to all the places you told me and some of them have been demolished now. So, you know, obviously I couldn't see exactly where it was that they lived and they said, oh, we knew you'd say that. So they had all these photos of the original residences so I could see where my ancestor had lived. But the best bit of all is they showed me where my great great grandmother, the one who couldn't read or write, where she had lived. And they had a, a photo of the back view of the building that she lived in. And you can see my flat in the corner of the photo. Oh, what a beautiful story. And I was like, oh, wow. So she would have looked it's up. chilling. Yeah, she would have looked up there and she would have never in her wildest dreams, you know, this woman who couldn't read or write and had a pretty, you know, grim life. She died when she was only like 38, I think it was, and had a lot of children, some, one of which died not long after her. But she, she would never in her wildest dreams have thought one of her descendants would own that little flight. So it's just this can great thing. Can we back the bus up a bit? <laughs> like, you can <laughs> see I've shocked you. I love it. It's crazy, um, but it's also kind yeah. of logical. The story about your great-grandmother and your grandmother coming over and leaving her husband what was that about do you know well of course it's you know the thing is I had this kind of cynical mind that's why I was like I need to engage a genealogist to get to the real facts because there's a lot of story around it but I said and my mum and I were talking about this of course and my mum said oh you know this is what this is what I've been told 
I said, but that would have been Margaret, my great grandmother's story. And she might have been, you know, making that a certain sound a certain way. But the story was that he didn't come out with them and that he had either gambled the fair away or something had happened. He didn't join them and that he was supposed to rejoin them later, but he never did. So I've kind of like in my mind, I think what happened was that Margaret had this opportunity to come to the Darling Downs and some of her relatives had already gone there. And I think for William, her husband, and I don't know what their marriage was like, who knows, it might have been, you know, not so happy. He was born on that island. He was a fisherman. That was his skill. That was his where he came from. He came from a long line of fishermen and he died on the island. So he had lived his whole life as a fisherman on this island. So potentially the idea of leaving there and going to the other side of the world to live in a place where there's no sea mm. might have just been a bit too yeah. much. I mean, it's so tricky, isn't it? You think he might have said, I'm not going. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, so many possib- possibilities. Yeah. How would she have survived, I wonder? I think she was pretty feisty. I have right. to say, I'm really, I, I through Looked my up, eyes. By go, family and friends or? Well, she would have had some relatives, I guess. And she had her daughter, my gran, Mary Jane with her, but also her other son, Archie, who was older. So uh, they got a farm on the Darling Downs. And that's, you know, I have to say. She, I, she bought a farm, did she? So I don't know how that happened. Yeah, just sure. tell me too, Kylie, because the listeners can't see you, but I can. You're a beautiful redhead oh, thank and you. fair skin. <laughs> So when you got to Scotland for the first time, did you feel some type of connection to country? Oh, absolutely. That's what I was saying. When I got to that, I mean, I love Scotland. I really do love going there. And when I go to that island um, and to my flat, it's like honestly such a wonderful experience for me. And I was talking to someone about it the other day and they said, so what do you do when you get there? And I said, well, I've made lots of friends. I said, you know, there's... You know, I'm really good friends with my Scottish solicitor and we, you know, we hang out together and I've become very good friends with these people in Glasgow and I've got friends in Edinburgh. And when I walk through the village, I know quite a lot of people, I suppose there's not that many tall Australians hanging out there, but I've managed to make a lot of friends and I feel very at home there when I go there. And yeah, I th- that's why to me it didn't seem like a, a crazy thing to do. I guess I'm quite a sentimental person too because I wanted to, as a nod to William, who was left behind, I wanted to make sure that the flap was decorated in his tartan colours, which are navy and dark green, which are obviously beautiful colours anyway. So there's a lot of like nods to that family tartan and um, half of the stuff there is like stuff that antiques that I found on the island that are pre-loved. So there's kind of this really nice feel with a few modern pieces. But I also wanted to make sure that he didn't feel forgotten. One of the things that my great-grandmother had brought out to Australia was this beautiful commemorative plate of Robert Burns and I think when I found out when it was made it was like she probably their wedding gift and so she brought it all the way to Australia so I took it all the way back (laughs) so it's now back in my flat and so I think that was their wedding gift and so this plate has traveled over over I think it's a span over 104 years it's gone from Scotland to Australia on a ship that took three months and then I took it all the way back so now it's in the flat and so I often go, well, you know, here you go, William, you know, this could have been your wedding gift. It's a bit like um, buying records when you're away on holidays, which my husband often does, and then how do you get them back again? But taking yes. that plate back, how did you I was really worried, up? I have to say, and I had it in my hand like, luggage and it was like wrapped up in all this bubble wrap and jumpers and things to make sure it was okay. But I was really nervous thinking if I break this thing just because I'm being ridiculously sentimental, I'm going to forgive myself. But it's happy as Larry there and it's never looked better. Mm. And the other thing that was really nice is I took my mum there for her 80th birthday last year and that was wonderful to have that kind of experience together and we found William's grave together, which was really nice. Yeah, it was really nice. The reason I ask you about that connection to country, it was my husband and I went to Ireland um, last year or the year before and everyone there looked like me. They have white freckly skin, they've got blue eyes. I even took a photo of a lady and sent it to my sisters and they said, oh, which one of our relatives is that? And I said, no, no, it's a stranger. Uh, it is yeah. a weird feeling, isn't it? Yes, that's the thing that I think is also really interesting too. And, you know, you get that sort of sense as you get older too is like I know that my uh, my body shape is more like my grandma's but my head and um, even the way I tilt my head in photos is my grand. And I've got her eyes. I know I've got her face. Mm. So it's kind of weird. I feel like I'm a blend of my two grandmothers. And, yeah, so but Isn't it's 
so it's really interested. funny when you see photos of her when she was younger it's sort of years like looking at yeah, yeah. but I, I do feel very comfortable there and it's and it's lovely because my friends go and stay there people go and stay there who I know and so it's well used. That's, I was going to ask you, so how long of period do you go for at a time? So I, t- I try to go there this year. I'll be fortunate enough to have been there four times, believe it or not. I usually have, the longest I've been there was like I had a stint almost two weeks there last January. As my kids get older, I think that I'll go and spend more time there. At the moment, you know, my son's in grade 10. My daughter's in university. So there's still a few more years to work through until they're more self-sufficient. But I think as I get older, I would like to spend more time there and let... Mum, everyone else is going to the Gold Coast and yeah, dragging us off right. to cold, yeah. rainy Scotland. Yes, yes. Well, they've both Can't been just... there. And uh, Ruby has been there twice. Hamilton's been there just the once. Ruby did say to me, I think her she's, she's got a very dry sense of humour and her opening comment was, it's a hell of a commute. And <laughs> why does it have to be that far away? It's a really long way. But the last time she went, I think she enjoyed it. And uh, particularly, she likes London. Yeah. yeah, that's a great story. And you know, I'm sure that it wouldn't be I wouldn't be the first person who would say you should write a book about that. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, I do have a blog actually that I because I I love writing, so I um, write my Scottish blog, which has got all the stuff about the renovation journey and all about my ancestry and all my discoveries over there. So, so I I do write that, but I, I'm kind of watching it, going. I think I should probably turn this into a book at some point. Mm-hmm. What's, um, what's the blog called? It's called, oh, this is the other bit. I forgot to tell you this, but this is the, the most hilarious bit of all. And I remember talking to a friend of mine about this when I was deciding to buy this flat. And most people, include, I could tell my family thought I was mad, but I didn't really care. I just, I just, for me, it made perfect sense. Around the island is a body of water called the Kyles of Butte. I mean, was there ever a sign? A sign. A sign. And so I was like, well, there you go. It's, it, it's meant to be. And so my flat is called the Kyles of Butte. And I have a, a blog called thekylesofbute.com. Excellent. And, the uh, Kyles of Butte. We yes, need to check it out yes. and go and read about the journey. Yeah, yeah. no, it's great Now, fun. unfortunately, I am running out of time. I, can you tell me quickly about where you want to be in five years' time with your incredible um, corporate career? Oh, look, I think that for me, the most important thing is to keep working with people that I really admire and enjoy spending time with. I have less tolerance for people who are not good people so much anymore. So for me, it's really important about working with good people and doing interesting work. I would like to probably spend a bit more time in Scotland as I get older. And for me, it's really about having that nice blend of work and doing stuff that's really interesting. And I feel like I'm adding some value and learning, but also spending time with good people. That's really, they're the key parameters for me. And nowadays, I'm quite happy to say no to something if I don't feel that they're my kind of people or if the work's not really something that I would enjoy. And the first thing I learned in the AICD course was don't join a board just because you feel honoured that they asked you. Yes, yes. And I did want to hear about, you wrote an article about false humility and you said in that, we live in a time where self-promotion is rife, being on brand is deemed to be critical. And I think that's so interesting, particularly talking about politics and the world of politics at the moment. But yes. what I am going to do is ask you who your favourite royal is now as a Scottish person. Oh, my goodness, you might be a bit conflicted here. I am a bit conflicted <laughs> because I would say, actually, my favourite royal would have to be Queen Elizabeth I because she was just a remarkable woman and I have read this incredible book about her. I've read lots of books about her, but one that I loved was one that compared her to um, all the best CEOs and the lessons for her from her for CEOs and she was a remarkable woman, like how she managed to work in a very bipartisan type way with both people from a Catholic background and Protestant background and bring them together to get the best out of, you know, talent across an entire divided nation that was actually in, in a lot of financial strife when she took it over. So I would say she would be my favourite, but coming in very close would be <laughs> Robert the Bruce. Tips. Robert oh. the Bruce, he's amazing. Tell me about he, Robert the Bruce. Oh, my goodness. As I delve deeper into Scottish history... He was a, a remarkable leader as well and, um, you know, he, he was very good at strategy. He managed to defeat the English and take back the Scottish lands. This is ongoing, terrible. I mean, I can see the trauma that's happened for that country over many centuries is just horrendous, but he was a very good leader and very well celebrated, I think, as, yeah. as one of the best kings in Scotland. What sort of era was Robert the Bruce? So I knew you were going to ask me that. I think it's, is it the 1200s or 1300s? a long time back 
Yeah, so uh, yeah, really what, impressive what a, man. What a great but, answer. But this is the best bit of all. <laughs> At one point, Robert the Bruce actually reclaimed back Rothsay Castle, which is on the Isle of Pete, where my flat is. Yeah, so, so yeah. Like he didn't get a hold of Kyle's, uh, what is it? <laughs> the the Isles of, of Kyle. Yeah, <laughs> Kyle. Yes, that's right. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, that might yes. be something that we need to, you know, you talk about having your stretch goals. So, you know, my stretch goal for this year might be to find out more about Scottish history. Yes. Okay. Now, you seem like the type of girl who would like a dance, like a shimmy. And um, what's the song that can't keep you off the dance floor, Kylie? Generally, anything with ABBA. I, can, I know I love ABBA. I still love them. And, but you know, I I, know I love anything seventies disco as well. I have to say, but generally, I, I'm pretty much up for a dance anytime. And do they have a lot of dancing? Are they quite sort of. Would you say do you understand the Scottish humour? You understand the Scottish. When we were in Ireland, I, I could hear that music in the pub, and I could hear that sort of the fiddles playing, and I just loved it. You know, I'm so embarrassed to say I have not been to Ireland, and which is really interesting because you can actually see Northern Ireland from some parts of Scotland where my family's from. I've never been there. I need to go. That will be one well, of my your stretch targets. That's my stretch yeah, goal. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I will do that. Your but, stretch um, goal. Okay, so anything from ABBA. I'm sure Leroy will be able to find you something from ABBA to t- <laughs> take out the segment. Kylie, this has been a wild ranging <laughs> interview. It probably didn't go in the direction that I thought, only because you had all those beautiful stories and all that sort of a circular story about the the Scottish and coming from Toowoomba and your grandmothers and it's just been a joy to have you on Victor's Corner. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Thanks. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me on Big Little Small Talk. I hope you can make the time to join me next week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favourite podcast app.